I'm going to talk about is um, a little less of design and a li little more of art. Uh, so I'm going to talk about breaking the design confines. Um, first things first, I mean, I need to do that. So there is a due diligence slide um, so, uh, if any of you use any products or services of these companies, uh, very likely you're using my work. So, I've delivered and led a lot of projects for uh, these clients and many, many more. We're done with it. This is not what I want to talk about. Um, what I really want to talk about is what you know, what you need to know about me before we kind of start is, um, so I was born in a country that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and this is that red dot uh, right there, you know, and the country is a large part, obviously. Uh, and I studied arts, uh, classical arts, in a classical academy of arts, and the beautiful picture you can see on the right is the library that we had. Don't worry, it never looked so sterile, actually. Um, and what we studied was painting, drawing, uh, sculpture, all the classical art disciplines alongside with philosophy, psychology, and you name it. I always wanted to do music for a living, and that's why La Bohème is there. I wanted to do opera, um, but unfortunately, there are a lot of mezzo-sopranos in the world, and I didn't kind of feel that I would be strong being one of them. Um, so then I went and did uh, quite a lot of uh, art and design projects. And as I studied classical arts, then um, apart from that obscure studies of uh, drawing that you can see over there, I moved into service design. Um, and what I did is, uh, quite a lot of services around uh, education. So you can see over there uh, my really, really old friend, at least 10-year-old uh, Pantufel, which is a learning and education service for parents uh, to enable them to create narratives and fairy tales for their children. Because this is how children learn how they perceive information. They do perceive it via stories. And that software uh, was helping them to do that. On the left, you can see a bit of a project called Patchwork, um, aimed at preserving uh, disappearing crafts and people who don't really use digital. Um, so basically, again, I, I moved into service design and I, uh, I started studying that. So what I really did is art because I loved it. I did design, I ended up in design because I felt I would be better at it and I felt, you know, I need to make it a little bit more tangible. And I needed to learn business and business language because ultimately someone has to be paying for all the great stuff that uh, we do. Um, so yeah, so I, I did those things. And at the moment where I ended up after this mixed art background slash service design um, is I am um, leading an experience design team. And in my dream, it's going to be a team, hopefully in reality, it's going to be a team of people who never use the term wireframe, who always talk, uh, rather than solutions really, actually problems, who ask a lot of questions, who you know, question things 10 times before they even approach any project. And this is my goal of building and leading that team. Uh, and I help deliver a digital transformation for the business that is uh, traditionally originated in print. So my dream in that respect uh, is that we're going to create a business where uh, we don't have the world digital in our offering anymore. And I have to explain that. I don't mean we have to avoid the word. What I merely mean is that it's going to be very, very all-encompassing and rather a response to the problems that we're really solving rather than a thing that we sell, digital thing. Uh, it's not really like that. You know, uh, you're now looking at your phone, you're smiling, you have a positive emotion. Is that physical or digital experience? Um, I think the answer to that is not really so straight as we think it is. So, but, but, this was always the case in my life. I, had to, I have to admit, it's going to be a very personal presentation. Uh, so that was always the case. I always looked at bringing art techniques into design, into my kind of daily life with a user experience team, with brainstorming, with trying to solve problems for clients and alike. So most of the times when I started to talk about art, <clears throat> my teams felt like that. They literally said, you're like flying into space, we can't keep up. This is not something you know, that we can do. And they also told me things like, you want to create a product inspired by what? What is the name of that period? We have to look at the competitors. You know, how do we use that? And actually, most of all, uh, this question was paramount. So how is any of this even relevant to what we do? And how are you helping us to uh, design and to achieve a better outcome by uh, bringing art into this whole picture? <clears throat> and I felt like this. 
most of the time. And I said, right, we, we need to develop some sort of language, so I need to help. As a designer, I need to help uh, them understand, I need to help myself create that, that kind of common frame of reference, which I believe currently in many agencies, client side, agency side, we're so siloed and so kind of blindly following that process of delivery that we don't even have time to think about anything outside of that frame of reference, really. So, today I'm going to just talk about articulating the value of one's experiences, transforming that experience, in my case, art, into something that you can later apply to your design process in a very tangible way. So, let's come back to art. <clears throat> this is where I'm comfortable. Uh, so we won't look at all the fine arts. Uh, we'll look at three areas which I specifically studied and I kind of, you know, uh, know quite well. So it's performing arts and the oldest, to be honest. I mean, all the visual arts are one of the oldest uh, art, arts recorded, arguably. Um, so performing arts, music, theater, dance. We'll look at visual arts, two-dimensional, which are painting and drawing are part of that. And we'll look at visual arts that are three-dimensional, so architecture, right? So here's an example for you. That's a musical dice game. Um, so it's claimed to be authored by Mozart. So in the late 18th century, uh, what happened was the dice games were generally really pretty popular. Um, and he was the first one uh, who thought about applying it to music. So what that does is you basically you roll the dice and it creates a combination of uh, musical parts of them, you know, um, the song, parts of the musical kind of area, and still making a, perfect, uh, making a perfect creation at the end of it. So no matter how you do it, basically, uh, you get a minuet uh, out of those combinations that are available to you. And if you ask me, that's like a precursor to coding <laughs> more than anything else. Uh, so what he brought is serendipity and chance, and this is amazing, and he uh, is kind of recorded as a father of aleatoric music, where basically some element of the composition is left to chance, and a primary element of composed work's realization is left to the determination of its performers. Now think back to design. Uh, do we always design thinking of how users are actually going to grow and change our product? I think this is so important. And this is that randomness and that chance uh, that he brought in into a fairly rigid structure at that time, uh, made a lot of changes for everyone that came after him. And this is why I always say it's so important how we speak about design now, because we're changing the tissue of, you know, what is the industry is. Second example, uh, painting. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. So that's Salvador's Dali most famous painting, Persistence of Memory. And what was, it was based on, it was pretty obvious. So again, he drew the inspiration from two uh, kind of, you know, two very, very firm theories that appeared at that time. So uh, Einstein's theory of uh, relativity, which is a reconfigured understanding of nature of time, and Freud, uh, all the psychoanalytic theories, sleep and so on. It was all in the early 1905, 1910, so, that, that, that's, that was the time when these theories were coming to fruition and what he has done, you know, he has kind of rethought it and embodied it in the, in the work that he's done. So, last example on the art side. So architecture, Frank Gehry, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with his work. So that's a museum of Guggenheim in, in Bilbao and generally a lot of Frank Gehry's um, buildings, he recognized that, they were inspired by fish. Um, and there are two theories around it. One is very kind of mundane and one is pretty romantic. So the mundane one was that it was uh, his grandmother's favorite dish and she used to cook it very often and he loved it and therefore he used the fish as the motive for his buildings, brilliant. S uh, second one was that uh, fish was something that uh, was there long before us. And it's a very romantic notion of embodying something within architecture, something that is very different and something that has been there much before humans were. So, let's have a thought. What would have Mozart composed, you know, Dali created or Frank Gehry constructed, designed, if they were only drawing from contemporaries? I think it would be pretty different from what you've just seen. So, it's a good time to talk about inspiration within design. What do we usually do when we start a design project? I bet you, 
that we do things like that. We look at awards, we look at webbies, we look at favorite, com favorite competitors, we look at the industry, we look slightly outside of the industry. I'm not talking about listening to the users right now. That's a very, very important part, but as a creator of something new, or rather, you know, combining something new, you always look for visual stimuli as well as audio stimuli and everything. And, and you know, this is the places we, we kind of refer to and we say, isn't it cool? Um, every time that the client told me I would like an experience as Apple, Amazon, or uh, you know um, anyone else, I, I should probably you know I should <laughs> drop a coin. And it's it's literally it's it's that. It's very much let's look at these other guys uh, doing the thing next to us and do a very similar thing. So what could we do instead? And this is the question that I felt was really really important, and I loved my team to my teams to go and explore that. So there's going to be some triggers. So here you go, let's take performing arts. Um, and the exercise that we have done certainly uh, in the theater, uh, when I was part of kind of a theater group was, uh, it's quite a famous one, it's a chair exercise. We called it a chair exercise. Um, so it's usually performed in, in a couple, you look at each other um, and you're trying to express absolutely everything you have to express, like a love monologue or anything like this, only using one word. It could be a chair, it could be a stool, it could be anything. So, uh, you know, if I were to do it right now, it would be something like, you know, chair, chair, chair. And you flex the constraint, right? You have one constraint, you have to communicate with it, and it starts uh, some kind of different mechanisms within you that, you know, you, you, you weren't quite aware of before. So, transferring this into design directly, what if we use something like rule of one? So if you were limited to one rule, you know, what would, how would the output look like? So for example, you're allowed to use only one module, one shape, one word to express everything. How would you design? Now, this is our lovely strategist, George. And what George is doing over there um, is he's showing the interface he designed for an events um, site only using circles, and he's rationalizing it. Um, the beauty of it actually is, it's not how the final product looks like, let me just ensure that, uh, but it makes you think about what kind of visual, and not only visual constraints and practical constraints, uh, can you put on yourself in order to design slightly differently, design out of the mental models that you have, the models of pages or even journeys sometimes, how previous experiences that you've experienced when you came to this building, how do they affect your design now, and how can you use that um, within the game of constraints, if you like. Another way of doing it, so this is a part of what I've done, it's uh, taking metric feet. Um, for those of you who like poetry, I'm pretty sure you know what it is. So this is just, you know, this is the way that the poetry is constructed. So it's a stressed and unstressed syllables. And there are only plenty of them, it's actually only, what, 12 of them uh, in total. And they're all named in a way that I can't pronounce in English, so I apologize and I won't attempt that <laughs> because I did learn in my, it in my native language. Uh, but basically, the way that you could transfer it to the interface, imagine you're playing with it and you're saying, right, one syllable is stressed, one is unstressed. Uh, how could I transfer that potentially into the interface and into the balance within the interface? And you have the whole kind of visual library and exploration that follows that if you equate rhythm to an item within a visual design library. So it is, again, it is just a game, but it's a game that enables you to explore. It's a constraint that pushes you a little bit further than where you would be. Second one is abstraction. So this is an exercise that we were, um, we were, when we were learning painting, it was very important, so we used to paint in a very, very realistic manner and then gradually decompose our paintings into a complete abstraction. So for example, in the second step, I would flatten the colors. On the third step, I would move the plane slightly. On the fourth step, and so on. And basically, the end result uh, would be very much kind of reductive, sort of, you know, what, um, what we were talking about before, very reductive expression of the idea. But it's very purposeful abstraction. It's not because I decided to sit down and say, let me just feel something and draw. It's very, very, very interesting. So we thought, okay, how can we apply that? And what we've done is, um, so in this event, um, 
we do Global Service Jam, which is 48 hours for social good, so we design services for social good. And in one of those events, the, the main constraint is that you have a very little time to present your findings. And you have a bit of time for research, but then you, you don't have time to sit and process kind of endless, uh, you know, endless data to you and endless insight to present back. So we said, how about we decrease the length of the bridge between the research itself, findings debrief, and design? And we've done a few things there. So um, as you can see, so basically, the one on the right is um, we were trying to figure out how much people are aware of their surroundings and their neighbors, namely. Uh, so we've asked, them, we've asked people uh, on the streets to place uh, sugar uh, accordingly to how many people, like how well do they know people and how close do they know people. So uh, the couple represented the house. So if I know most, most of the people I know within my community are in my house, I place the sugar in a cup. Uh, f moving further, it's like, yes, I also know people in, within the street and within the community, and that enabled us very, very quickly to get kind of a data vis like picture, which I failed to take in here. It should be from the top properly, so you can see the actual spread of uh, how many people knew other, um, others. So that's kind of one example of how we shortened that distance. And the same, that second example is over there, so we've asked uh, people around culture, and no one could quite define culture in a very succinct manner. So what we've asked them to do, we said, okay, if you were leaving tomorrow, um, what would be the only one thing that you would take with you to represent your culture? And uh, what they've done is they've just written it out on the balloons and put it in the bag. And it was really fascinating because the service that was born after this was kind of servicing the needs of people that uh, are leaving their country and they're missing certain products or services or things, not necessarily tangible things. Uh, but this gave us a really, really good understanding of, of what that was, even with that small sample of um, respondents, small sample of people. And the last one is uh, metaphors. So, you know, from art, again, interpreting and portraying something uh, really rigid and visually recognizable as something else. So we're doing this now, that's why I'm not going to talk about it in a great detail. But uh, site is a metaphor. So imagine you were to design a site as a tree, what would the roots look like? Uh, you know, what would the uh, branches look like? What would the leaves be? Would that condition your design in any way? Could you play it like that? What if you go to a macro level? If, you know, if your site was a natural phenomena, would it be, you know, how would the water kind of, how would the journeys go? How would they cir circulate and so on? So again, it's, it's supplying slightly different thinking that is very, very, again, it's been tested by centuries and centuries, you know, by disciplines within art. And we seem to have forgotten a little bit on how to apply it. So the language we're developing is partly that. So we developed those trigger cards, which we use in ideation and so on. And they kind of based, um, loosely based, but are based within, uh, on the core techniques uh, within art. So we do and play uh, with that. And the beauty of the concepts, they're very fundamental and they're very, also very uh, easily adaptable in the sense that, you know, uh, they're easily understandable by different people. You don't need to be a designer to design. This is a fundamental, I think if we think that we've been really exclusive and it's not, you know, it's, it's not how it is design happens, whether you participated in it or not. I think that's, that's one of the main things. So if there was anything I learned, <laughs> I would say we all steal and it's not about, uh, you know, it's not about being original. There is nothing original, it's just new combinations. So stealing fundamentals and operating within fundamentals, not trends, uh, you know, the next 10 trends, uh, the next, uh, I don't know, skeuomorphism or similar things. It's about distilling things that are very fundamental and that are not features. They're, they're not going out of fashion. It's about understanding, interpreting, and rebuilding things and applying those principles. Uh, second one is about finding constraints. So all the examples that I talked about, they are strongly based on constraints and constraining yourself uh, within many situations can give you very, very interesting results. You have to do it uh, very consciously, um, but it's very, very interesting. And venturing out of your comfort zone, uh, tracking your least favorite walks. Um, third one is seek complexity. I'm definitely not here to dispel complexity in any way. I think designing seamless experiences um, 
is not really optimum way. You know, when I was uh, sitting there and I was a bit nervous before the talk, what I caught myself doing is I was kind of flicking through my uh, Twitter. It was almost like, uh, you know, it was Pavlovian <laughs> gesture. It's designed seamlessly. It's beautiful. But is that really what we want to become in this, you know, 100 years? <laughs> um, I don't think so. I think it's about, you know, training the eye to see training, you know, nose to inhale the new ways of connecting things. It's trainable. You can definitely work on it. And pushing the boundaries of what's usual, usable, simple, possible, and viable. Um, and every time someone asks me for like a very simple, to the point product that really solves all these needs, my first question is really like, what exactly do you want to achieve with it? We understood the problem, but in terms of the solution, why are we imagining the solution being so linear, so streamlined? It could be much more interesting. We can create services that inspire and that are memorable. There is so much to play with if you just widen your uh, reference field just a little bit. That's it. Thank you.